So this is what's going to happen today. <laughs> oh. Namaste, welcome everyone to Satsang this morning here in beautiful Rishikesh, windy, beautiful, fresh morning. And uh, for all those who are joining us via broadcasting, warm, heartful welcome to you uh, today. Um, uh, yesterday, if I could just begin like this, um, just checking first if you can hear me okay at the back. I began yesterday by just asking that uh, for those who are perhaps new to satsang, who may have just dropped in or so, I would uh, just encourage you, you're very, very welcome, please sit, uh, be comfortable. But I would appreciate if you don't just raise questions immediately. I'd like to leave this space more open 
for those who have been following uh, the pointings over some time and who have come to with an attitude of finalizing um, uh, any doubts, to remove any doubts or to come more with clearer understanding today. And we will love to continue in this vein. And those who have come and you may feel that you want to put a question and uh, I would just ask you, it's fine because um, that which brought you here is going to take care of you. It does not have to take the form of a question and answers if you are just so new. And you may hear things that may not be easily digestible at first, but I'll ask you just to trust that, trust, just trust being here. For those who feel that they have more, more, more specific questions, uh, you're invited to, to put your hand up. So, thank you. <clears throat> Namaste, Muji. Good morning. Namaste to you. Yeah. I want to ask you about Papa G. I was watching a video about Papa G, and he said, "Free is the one who is free from desire." And he said that we come here, we experience life again and again because we still have a human desires. And he said, if you want to be free of desires, you have to attend the satsang. And I come today to ask this question, how to become free from desire? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm going to go on the short excerpts uh, that you have presented of Papaji, something Papaji has said. And uh, so let's begin like this. I mean, no one can, be, can exist without no desire at all. Life itself is desire. Uh, but uh, what the Master is pointing to is uh, attachment to desires, deep emotional, psychological, identified, you know, attachment to desire. Uh, desire for food, the desire for exercise, desire to be in the company of friends and to enjoy, these don't leave uh, any bad smell in the consciousness. But desires which lead to craving, desires which are about you know neediness, the sense that one cannot exist happily without getting the things that one projects, such desires they are not in support of your freedom. This is what he, he means. But natural desires, natural desire, desire to, to take rest when you are tired, the desire to go walking uh, uh, spontaneous as a feeling arise in you the desire to exercise, the desire to, to be in the company, uh, particularly of um, righteous people, these desires, uh, they don't uh, harm you. And they are also called desires. So it is good to differentiate or to discern what the Master speaks. If he just speaks a desires, period, is not good. Then it means that the human intellect and the natural uh, reciprocal play with life is, is, is not good, because desire is also there. Also, Desire for a particular kind of food can be called a desire, but it doesn't, if it doesn't lead to uh, attachment, to neediness, to greed, then, uh, then it is not harmful. So again, what Master's meaning is that the desires which we are constantly thinking about because we can have a desire whereby, um, you know, there's no space for other things to float through your space because constantly you're looking for a way of fulfilling your desires. And he's pointing to say that such desires are only temporarily satisfied. They just rise up again and you just keep on keeping, keep on in this need. And uh, it's very difficult to, to get to break the spell of them. Now, you start by saying, now, you want to be free of desires. 
having heard me say which ones are natural, they don't leave any footprints in the consciousness, you understand that, okay, it frees you up to not be, or oh, any, but the ones that we can identify as the thing that preoccupy your attention often and uh, you're easily distracted when, these, when these, these forces come, then we can look at them. You ask how to do it, how to be free of them, how to be free of them. If you are a devotional being, you may present that in prayer to the Supreme Self, to the Lord of the Universe. You may say, I am, I am not good, I am I'm not able to control my projections, I'm just uh, so weak, I don't have any power of determination, all these things, they are too much for me, please help me to transcend them. Then power comes. Power comes through your, your humility and openness and honesty. A power will come to help you there. If you are more able to reflect on the kind of advice that I give, it will begin like this, that the desires come, can they exist? Can a desire exist without the desirer? They go together. You cannot see a desire floating around by itself looking for somebody. It is a relationship, no? So when the desire comes, find the one for whom it comes, the one who suffers it. And for this you just have to be quiet and you feel the desire, don't immediately try to get rid of the desire because you don't get rid of it actually, you only can pick up something to distract you from it temporarily. But when it's time for you to really look and to apply the kind of advice that you may hear in satsang, it would be to, first of all, use the desire to identify the one who is desiring. Now, if you're not used to this, it might feel, what is he talking about? It's me. And it says, okay, then just catch hold of and identify the particular aspect of the meanness that is having this strong relationship with this desire. You don't have to create this. Please, just follow it. The desire comes. Feel the presence of the desirer. And you feel, yes, what does the desirer want? What does it want? What does it want from this desire? And slow down, look at that, and you may find that it feels that by satisfying this desire, it's going to be happy. You may not think, I'm going to be happy forever. We say, I'm going to be happy now. Okay? And we are quite happy to say, go along with it, to feed this desire. And what happens is, when these desires, which are to be overcome, because the more you are desiring desire and become attached to desire, you don't realize it, but you're becoming weak in your system. You see? And gradually, some desires, they may seem, you may tell yourself, but they are harmless. It's not, you know, it's not any big deal. But subtly, they are feeding into developing a certain kind of habit and tendency, hmm? and occupying a, a good amount of space inside yourself. So the Master is only pointing, be watchful of this. It is possible to come out of any desire, and every desire in the way that I'm speaking. First of all, just look if you can start in a very simple way, you can say, okay, what is the desire or the attachment for? And you identify. You can even write it down if, because when you begin to target a particular kind of phenomenon and you're really getting somewhere, you will experience a kind of blurring of your focus. It is as though something doesn't want to be discovered. And everybody feels that. So it's good you write down, okay, so what, what is this desire and its fulfillment promising? It's promising that uh, a, a happiness and uh, like this, no? And so you can write that down. And, uh, and the one who is looking forward to this, can we see if we can identify it energetically? Can you see this one? And just by turning the attention like that, the force of the desire or any other attachment or projection begins to just to break up, it begins to open up. 
If we don't do this, it continues to feed and can become so powerful a force that you have a sense that you have no resistance against this desire. You see? So the Master is only pointing, you can follow like that. This way of looking we call inquiring, self-inquiring, is to identify the particular aspect of self that has created a relationship with that particular phenomenon. And as you do, you stay with it, because sometimes the mind will present you another thing to look at. It is like, you're coming too close. What about this? He said, no, stay with this one. Stay with it. And you may find that you keep losing focus, losing focus. You see? But just bring it back when you can and just keep looking. And gradually, if you keep your attention on this and you are determined to, to not run away from the facing of this, you may find at some point this happens. <gasps> And so the energetic presence of that desire begins to come out like that. Keep your attention on it. You feel a sense of relief. Don't start to celebrate yet. Yes. Go back again and keep looking. And gradually these energies begin to leave you. It will come again, but each time it loses power because of the intensity of your focus, it will keep breaking up. Once you experience the possibility of successfully transcending those energies when they come, you will grow in confidence to take on anything, because you can meet any desire, any attachment, any force in the same way like this. So that is the power of self-inquiry. Self-inquiry works in this way, that as you keep applying it, you keep maturing in it, and it is as though a force inside begins to teach itself how to inquire. The more you stay with it, the more these forces begin to lose their virility or the power of influence over you. Okay? Over you, I can begin a deeper inquiry as to who this you is also. But I won't go into that right now. Start one thing at a time, like this. Whatever thing is coming up and you want to take a look, just take a look. If you don't feel, the man is going to say, you didn't succeed. Okay? So you have to be very, very, very subtle about it. Don't be working for yawning. Okay? It just the important thing is just to keep looking to see can this be what I am? You see? The one who is attached. Can this be who I am? Because why would this question come and be effective? Because you are perceiving it. And if you are perceiving it, it must be an object of perception. It cannot be the one who is perceiving. And gradually you come into it like that. Some people they, they don't feel the, that they have the level of concentration to follow the inquiry. Well, actually, don't despair, don't give up. You may also, if you feel to pray, ask God, please teach me this inquiry. Let me see. But don't close the door and say, no, it's not for me. Because we are doing this with all kinds of things and we limit your range of power. So just stay open and you'll find your way. But there must be an earnestness within you to say, I feel, I can feel the light in this. I, I want to follow this thing. Rather than just going cold turkey and then wait until the whole thing blows over by itself. Which is also happening, that also happened. But like I say, you cannot win a fight when it's finished. So while it's happening, you will bring your inquiring in. Not in some hurried, excited way, but just quietly start from a place of, of... Always feel that you're starting from a place. If you see the agitation, and you're seeing the agitation, acknowledge that you're starting from a place of stillness to look. 
Okay. When, when I start to look from that place, the I amness, the need become less. The need of desire, it become less, but still have desire. And like there's no conditions anymore. Like you even can also look at this statement. Who is it that have desire? Slow down. Be very, just slow down your questions frame by frame. You're using words and we are accepting them quickly. Who is it that have the desire? Don't take it for granted because much of what you think you learn is just your habit. Just take a look. Who is it that have the desire? What it means you have the desire? Who has the desire? You see? Don't just assume language. Prove it. Who have the desire? For whom does it come? And initially, there may be some resistance arising from the mind to kind of say, don't, that's not for you, that's not good. Don't go with this resistance. Stay with it. And gradually, that pocket of resistance will just kind of open up and you feel the space whereby, you know, the looking becomes easier. Okay? But just to assume, yeah, you know, I still don't get rid of desire. I have the, the desire is still there. This I feeling, the reason why it's still persisting, because it doesn't get questioned. You assume that this I is the fact of who you are. But this I also, you can begin to inquire into its nature, because it is also phenomenal and it is also a function of consciousness. It is not the source or sentient consciousness. It is a, an adopted identity. But no one questioned this. Nobody questioned it. We all assume that but this is me. I want this thing. I want to get rid of this mind. I want to stop. But the very one who wants to get rid of the mind, want to stop, nobody questioned. Is this one sincere? Is it true? Because he says yesterday and tomorrow he's saying maybe. He's not consistent. And the fact that as soon as it is recognized that this identity which feels so intimate, seems so true, is also observable, a greater space opens up and you find you're in this greater space and not so hot about feelings. There's more detachment, more space. This is the fruit of your inquiry. As, as you said that uh, a, man, a man is for God and a woman is for God. We are not for each other. It depends we, on the level of our identity because yeah. if the level of our identity is that you strictly identify with manhood on, and, and womanhood, if you have strong identity as a woman, as a mother, as a father, as a man on these things, then it's definitely going to feel that man is made for woman and woman is made for man. Okay? It's only as you evolve beyond the bodily identification, it's not so strong a hold on you, because that's a severe limitation on the expression of consciousness. As you begin to discover this, you see, the grip of this man consciousness, woman consciousness, begins to loosen. Some people are attached very strongly to that and they don't want, they are afraid. I don't want to lose my manhood. I don't want to lose my, my motherhood. We have all kinds of different kinds of ego, you know. So, there is a mother, there's mother ego, there's grandmother ego, there's great-grandmother ego, there's great-grandfather ego, there's a special child ego, there is a priest ego, there's enlightenment ego, there's all kinds of ego expressions. But as you begin to look into them, they begin to break up because they are illusory in nature meaning that they only exist in your mind. You see? And so, it is worth looking at that. You say, you, you, something I have said and you are quoting, when I said, you know, largely human beings feel man is made for woman, woman is made for man. I said, okay, but man is made for God and woman is made for God. If you understand that, you see, you are out of this trap because actually, as you are waking up and transcending these different orientations and roles, 
you're coming into a much broader field of consciousness, you're slipping into formlessness, do not be afraid because every form is a limitation of some sort. Okay? We don't have to be running away from that because as you wake up to the truth of who you are, you will see the forms are not in the way of anything. It's only when we are touched, it feels like the form is in the way. As you wake up, you realize nothing is in the way. There's nothing is in the way. There is no way, actually. But though we may say this, to actually be in the experience of this is another thing. We may feel we understand that, but it is a kind of intellectual understanding, so it's not bearing fruit yet. The fruit of this is a knowing that is irrefutable, but it's not a knowing in duality, if you understand. We are coming to that as much as the capacity shows itself, then that level of deep experiential comprehension will happen in you. And it has to, because all journeys are ending in your heart all of them. It's not in Glasgow or someplace, it's all of them ends and resolve themselves in you. The journey is maybe from here to here as a way of speaking. I have, I have something that happens with me. I was in a long relationship till nine years, and when I start to experience my I amness, I start to see the attachment of the mind, the like you are for me, I am for you, and then I start to realize that we are all have desire and we have to be free, and I let go of conditioning, and that was not good with my partner. She said, "How you can go with another woman and?" Like, you are for me, I am for you. Why you want to go out with another? I told her, I so feel So you like let go of conditioning, but you went with another woman. <laughs> I don't think that is really representing my pointing, okay? I, I felt like I still want to go with the experience, uh, also a relationship with other women. Okay, but we just need to clarify, okay? Yeah, that, that's true. That is not the upliftment of consciousness <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> just checking, okay? Yes. okay so you have to stay with one one woman. No, 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 no. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Don't trap me in there kind of thinking. I don't know. <laughs> you need to look at that. <laughs> you see, sometimes the people are misinterpreting your teaching and pointing. You see, that's why it's important to keep it simple and direct because otherwise it becomes food for the mind and mind starts to develop all kinds of philosophies around a simple pointing. I am simply pointing to that which alone is not depending on anything, it doesn't have a craving for man, woman or breakfast or whatever, it is just perfectly in itself. Okay. So it's good to have a good relationship with one partner and share the journey with him. Are you asking me to prescribe a, a something? I want to know your... Uh, you know, you must look also, although at a certain la level, even for one who has awakened, may still on the surface have a relationship, of course, and it could be even beautiful. You've seen in many um, of the, the expressions of like Lord Krishna, association with Radha, with Shiva, Pavati, it's pointing to that there is a sort of harmony, a kind of balance. But it's not necessarily an attachment, you see, in that way. It's not a craving in, in that way. Asian. But it's tremendous beauty in it, a tremendous aliveness, tremendous love, tremendous l wisdom can pour when the balance is right, when you are not in need of the other. Because if you are in need of the other, you intensify the play of duality. Now people may ask, but how is it possible to have a relationship in non-duality. Well, I'm going to tell you, forget about duality and non-duality, because your mind is going to use that and go, oh, but how can you have a relationship in non-duality? And Shiva is going to laugh at you and say, you know, just keep quiet. You see, like that. You cannot know until that experience is birthed in you. You see, everything is fine. 
when you wake up, you're not going to see your mother as mother anymore? Is he? If you have a dog, you're not going to, you know, it's not dog, it's illusion. It's going to. <laughs> because the mind is funny like this. I remember one time in satsang it happened like that. That a woman was also looking and like this. And she says, You know, Swamiji, I, 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 I have a problem. I said, What is the problem? She said, I am coming to see that I am not real. But it's very difficult for me to believe my husband is not real. <laughs> so these are the kind of strangenesses that come up when we have not completed our inquiry. You see? It, all of this kind of, uh, you know, so just stay with it, it cleans itself. You simply stay with it and keep uh, watching, you see? All these things are modifications of the mind, they are playing out. And if you get pulled into them, they start to appear to be real. They seem to be intimate and profound and necessary to be engaged with. But that is only possible when you are pulled into the shape of a person, because that's when these forces of duality are activated and most active. As you begin to reflect and see that behind the facade of personhood and duality, there is a seeing which is non-personal, and you are there. You are not in a suffering state, you are in the most beautiful state. You are not saying, oh, okay, from now I am not married, from now… No, nothing of this. It is far beyond that. You are far beyond this. But it's not that you don't care anymore and you're throwing away the world. It's not like that. First, you clean yourself of all delusions like that. And as in that clean understanding, you see, everything is seen in the right context. You know? Not necessarily a fixed context. Something is very nice, flow. This is difficult to teach this. I can only show you how to come to this. And then this takes over by itself. It is a play. It is a play. It's very spontaneous. You cannot write a page of it because the next time it can also be different and yet always the same. So I don't want to go too far into that. It is enough if you feel within yourself, I feel this and yeah, yes, I want to stay with this. Stay with that single point rather than picking up four or five different points. Stay with that. Sink inside it and it will re reveal its, its mystery, its beauty in you. Thank you very much, Munchi. Thank you. Love you very much. Love you too. Thank you for the wings. Okay, wings as well now. Okay, all right. Can I speak with you? Namaste, Moji. Namaste. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy. I'm really blessed to be here. Although you have, I've never directly asked you a question till now. It's my second day here. But I feel that you inadvertently answer all my questions. I do not have a very... Um, I do not have a question really what all you just said, it was an answer to me. You said something about being afraid. I have been deep into self-inquiry, but I usually find myself stuck in that vortex, and it tires me. I'm afraid to take that leap, so I'm, I'm just here. Um, talking to you. Okay, let's start right there. You say you are afraid to take that leap. Yeah. What leap is that? Sorry. To go beyond the forms that, and that conditioning, so I feel like this ping-pong ball. Who do, who First just of all, you are in essence already beyond those forms. But your mind is not agreeing and nor accepting. The culture that you have uh, formed, 
and does not easily it feels I don't know about that. So um, you know what my reality is is that I'm afraid because I feel that I'm being asked to make a sacrifice of things that of how I feel I am to go maybe in this beyondness in a space that I don't know what is there. So okay. fear, fear comes. Mm. Maybe but I want to hear something from you that stays with me and pierces through because... If I say something, I hope it doesn't stay with you, but you use it to go beyond the fear. Yeah. Um, it is first of all important to identify the fear and its content. What is the message in the fear? And you say the fear is to go beyond the life you think you know into this state of beyondness. Why would you want to go there if there is not something, a subtle pull or intuition to say you can come? Perhaps earlier you may have already been in a state that you would have been afraid to be in the state you are now. You understand? And maybe at an earlier point, you may also have been afraid to come to where you are now. So you evolved into that state and now you are comfortable. But now to go again beyond this one, so to speak, no? feels like again... Mm. It's so, tiring. Eh? It's tiring. Tiring. It ties no, me up. What is tiring is the fear, not the transcendence. You see? Because something is inviting you to come. And something is afraid to go. Try and identify what exactly is afraid to go. You must have an intuition that you are going to more deeply into grace. Do you have that feeling or do you think you are going more towards the butcher's no. shop? No, I have. I know, but it just feels that it feels like a baggage that I know it hurts, but I'm not able to put it down, and I'm fighting. And the baggage, the the, the sense of the importance <clears throat> to put it down, and the fear. They are all things that you are experiencing and seeing. Is it not true? That's true. That's we can, true. We can start there. Just keep looking at that. This sense that I have to put my fear down, my baggage of the past down, and you know, then go into this space of the unknown. Hmm? These are images in your mind, isn't it? And 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 so there's a fear that what do you fear will happen then? Let's just slowly look at it. What do you fear will happen? The bag is put down, okay? The luggage is put down. And something that's kind of an intuitive sense that just let go of that for now so you can uh, receive or or go more deeply into something that you you have been asking for. Not something gonna come push you, push you. No, you asked, I want to go beyond. Isn't it? Yeah. And then uh, the answer has come, the invitation has come, and you're saying something's going not so fast. Yeah. So that resistance that is being perceived, don't identify with it. It's the sense of the person in you, because you're seeing there cannot be fear without personhood. No. You see? So the fear is an indication that your person, which is more of a psychological construct, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I do. Is experiencing or playing at experiencing a fear to be dissolved. That thing which is producing the fear actually does not exist. I don't know how these words are going to land inside your heart, because when the fear comes, it feels like it very much exists. You see? So how to go beyond this point? How to go beyond this point? Well, let's not turn it into a journey, because the man says, OK, you are here now, you feel safe, your next step is, whoa! Okay? So we are not going to make a journey. 
how about you just stay right where you are and don't hold on to anything at all? Try with me. Are you able to, or I'll be wasting my time to try no, it with you? I'm with you, Muji. Suppose right here, right now, I'm not asking you to put your foot one step ahead, right as you are here. Hmm? Just uh, don't identify with anything, any desire or any, any pressure to move into something, because the mind is the mind somehow is using it and creating some ugly pictures around that. So let go of that picture also. Let go of taking one step. Don't make any step. But don't hold on to any of these thoughts as though they are truths. Just be empty of them. Can you do this? Don't hold on to any shape. Not even the shape of being a person. Is it possible? Anyone can join in on this. Don't hold on to anything at all. Don't hold on to any promise about the future. Don't even hold on to the idea of enlightenment. Don't hold on to anything at all. I just want to meet you here for a minute. Be empty, empty, empty of any intention or any concept association. Okay? It doesn't need to take long also. So you're not holding on to any support. Hmm? When you're not associating with anything at all, past, present or future, or any desire or any fear, holding on to nothing. Just be aware of what remains here. What is it that is here? Speak from experience now. Tell us something about what is here when you are not holding on to any association with any thought form, any memory, any must do, any to do lists, nothing at all. It's empty. Empty, empty, empty. Okay. Beyond the answer of empty, There's this empty, emptiness. Okay. Hmm? Normally, mind will come to want to say something about this emptiness. It's as though there's a force within you that does not want you to recognize that emptiness. It's constantly putting things in you, in your mouth, so you're always chewing something. Hmm. So just be with this emptiness. You see? Do you have any history here? Any background, where you came from, who is your family and all this? Is there any of that here in this emptiness? No, nothing. Nobody. Nothing is here. Is there anything to be afraid of here? No. Is there anything missing from your life of value here? No. Are you in a state of success or failure here? No. Are you creating this space? No. No. Can it go away? No. <coughs> no. How are you here? By, by force? By, by concentration? Or are you just here? I'm just here. Yes. I've always been here. Yes. Is there anything to be afraid of? No. Why not? There's nowhere to go from here. Is that a disappointing discovery? No. It's wonderful. How can you how long can you stay here? Are you staying here or are you here? I am here. Yeah. 
something soon is going to have the feeling like, ah, oh, I lost it. What would that be? Mind. Which is where right now? Where is the mind right now? Invite the mind to say something, to throw its biggest punch now. Say the most horrible thing. You are imagining all of this. Mind will say, it is not going to last long. The mind is saying, this is not going to last long. It says that when you go back home, it will be gone. And it's speaking to who? <laughs> I'm just to checking. self. To, so to you're speaking, sir. yeah, uh, not you. You saying, no? You know, <laughs> you wait until you go back home. Yeah, and I'm afraid to go back home. <laughs> <laughs> it's this is how easy a world is created. Yeah, you are here as fear itself. Yeah. I ask you, is there any fear there? You say, no. Then the snake comes. You call the mind, so mind spoke. <laughs> mind spoke, and who was intimidated by mind speaking? <laughs> itself can't be intimidated. It's, I think it's the mind, it's, it's, it feels like a psychological vortex. All that needs to happen, you know, because mind simply come, he's not threatened, he says, <laughs> I got a few tricks on my sleeve. How about wait till you get home? <laughs> and immediately <sighs> what happened is just this message and something goes back into the shape of the fearful one. Is the fearful one anything other than a thought believed in? Just slow down with it. Because I'm not testing you just on your verbal answers. I want to see if you are speaking from your experience. No. no. Yeah. You see, this this is actually seeing, but it's not enough. A little one-off exercise for some people who have been searching for this kind of clarity. This clarity can be so powerful that the mind has very little chance to come in with the kind of influence it formerly had. But there is a tendency, a kind of reflex inside our system, that tends to, when the mind knocks, toop, 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 you say, yes, hello, your ex. Can I come in for a cup of tea? And you say, well, it's, it's a little late. You don't say no. And he goes, yeah, I was just passing by the area and I, I could smell the coffee and uh, I remember the good times we used to have. And, uh, what you say? And then you say what? Okay, just a quickie, okay? <laughs> Bang, you're finished, isn't it? You have to learn to listen to this voice that's coming up because he's fishing, auditioning for your, trying to get your attention. And, but if you stay, which I'm asking you when I say stay, because it's going to feel like you need to make a positive stance to say, I need to stay here. If I say, but you're just here, you're not staying, you may not feel strong enough to accept that statement. So I may invite you, you need to stay with this. So then when everybody's having lunch, you go sit someplace and uh, remain here and watch the play, but don't move from here. The mind has to come. You don't go to find him. He's to come, come, you know. Yes, you're feeling great now, but when you go home. This is your friend. This is your friend. He's with you all the time. This is your closest relationship. This is the voice that speaks to you. You wait until you go home. This is your finest moment. Hmm? Uh, a moment of 
of freedom, of real seeing. And what does this voice, your most uh, treasured voice, tell you? You wait until you go home. It's not going to last. And you've been listening to this voice all your life. Now you are asked to sit there and look and see, is it anything other than a voice that is used to getting more attention from you? And to that extent, you have developed an homegrown relationship with this kind of thought system. And don't be in despair if you stay with it, if you feel the oxygen of real liberation inside your system, you choose, no, I need to keep looking here, because when I'm here, I was speaking not only from here, but as here. Then a voice came and, oh, hello, and something seems to have gone. Something seemed to have gone. But because you are so associated with that one, it feels you have left. Or even worse still, the most beautiful thing in you have gone. So let's go back to this place again of just the place of isness. Just this thing. Is it trying to be itself? No. No. In any direction you look, can you come to the edge to the end of it? Is there a place where it's not that it can go to? No. Like this you must uh, reflect and stay with it. Because even if you spend five minutes here, it's giving you back your life. And it's time, you know, because you, you are suffering your thoughts. That's a kind of auspiciousness, actually. You are suffering your thoughts. You are becoming more tired. They are draining you, isn't it? Or draining your, your dynamic uh, presence. Because what? Of the strength of identity that believes that is strengthened through the fear. If you go in this way, you are going to lose everything. And there is a belief in you of one who is going to lose everything. So I invited you to voluntarily lose everything. Okay? Let everything go for a moment. You can get it back again. But I want you to experience how it is when you are not associated with anything at all. And are you willing to try? I am. Yes. So I said, not take one step forward or one backward. Just as you are, don't hold on or associate with anything. Just for this short time I am speaking with you. And how quickly you came, to this place in yourself that you are feeling there is no fear here. Maybe I prefer to hear your words again. What can you say of here, that which is just here? Did it arrive here? No, it did not. It's not. How strong is your mind right now? When you are aware of your own awareness place, how strong is the influence from your mind? How strong is the voice of your mind, of what it has to say to you? It is comparatively less, but often it feels like I am ripping about the ocean of thoughts and the water just gushes in. That activity Stop. is... You see what is happening? You have gone back into shape. You had to go into shape to speak those words. Would it have hurt if you stay shapeless? No. Are you less you? So this you must watch. This is your sadhana, just to, uh, to sit and keep looking, because very quickly something spurt, blah, 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 wants to say something. Yes, but when I go out, blah, 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 blah. so who, who? Who, who is speaking? Who is saying this? Mind. Yeah. Not just mind by itself, but the idea you have of who you are. It's just a kind of a psychic impression of your own self and your state, something speaking. But I've just pointed you 
again to a deeper awareness within yourself that you are not conscious of. When I asked you, are you looking at these things? And you admit, well, from here, they are not, they are irrelevant, they don't have a voice, they don't have any power. And then quickly, so therefore, the mind, as you, your mind is, is providing the cards that the mind is going to use for your identity, because that is your thing. Is you are not watching when something is pulled into identity. So I am going to say something to all of you now about that, because it's a good place that we have reached that I can talk to you about this. You are at the periphery of your own liberation. And what is happening now is that somehow it was important for me to ask you, just let go of your shapes, because we have been holding on to shapes, not because of love, but because of fear. A seed is in the mind that is saying that you need to protect yourself, you need to control. You cannot go into the emptiness because you don't know you are going to be lost there. And all these kind of thoughts, you, you are experiencing them like a kind of threat, like something is going to go wrong. A voice is calling you, and an intuitive response from you is to go there, but the fear says, wait a minute, you know, because I might lose everything. So look at the thing that you have that you are afraid to lose. What is it? What is your treasure? Show me your treasure that you think you are going to lose. All the psychology that I have built up all, all my life, that I believe that I was. Yes, which is your, this is your treasure you are sharing now. This is, yeah, all the information, all the relationships, all, all the sense of the idea of who I am, who I was, it, it kind of goes but not truly really goes away. That goes for a while, come back. It come and go, it come and go. Yeah. But its coming and goingness is also observed, isn't it? It is. This is crucial for me that I keep pointing you. It is. We have been watching the movie of our own projection, the movie of personhood. You are telling the story of the movie of your person. But I am going to ask you to do something, is to watch the one who, who believes this is my movie. When you feel, yeah, this, so what I want, I want this, this, and stop him right there when you say I, and say, which I is this? Because this I presently is representing what you are. What I want from my life, stop, stop. Who, who is I? Check it. Is, it. is this voice the voice of this pure place saying what I want from my life? Or is it just the body saying what I want from my life? Or is it the mind, so to speak? That is saying, what I want from my mind or from my life? Or is it a cocktail of the mind and self-belief that is saying, what I want from my life is this? And identify what is speaking. And each time you recognize, but again, it is again my self-image speaking. And in that instant, it is recognized, but that is observable. It is already observable now. Before there was no inclination to really look at that with distance. I was looking from that, thinking, this is what I am. This is the one who will receive grace, who will receive success, who will receive fear. But now you can see that even this one also is what? A construct. Can I speak like that? Are we on the same page with this? This is the important seeing that must take place in you. Just this. If you are doing this by itself, everything is going to untangle all these confusion states. You are going to be naturally aware that you are the awareness itself. 
and you have not travelled anywhere. You are just here, looking. But looking from a different position than when you were speaking before from the place of fear. So if I ask you that this is an exercise that I would encourage you to sit with this over and over again, I would like to have some feedback from you in a few days. Yeah? Would you take this on? Definitely, Mushi. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Muji. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've been waiting for so long to ask this question. It's very important to me. Okay. For quite a while, I've been walking on Earth feeling almost fearless. I feel like I can manifestation and just living with my passions in life and just walking around, I feel light. And what I'm, I find the most difficult for me right now is I came to the realization that I, I used to think that time is the most important thing in life. Time, you say? I, 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 used, to, I used to believe that time is the time. most important oh, yes, yeah. thing okay. in life, but I'm now I came to realize that time is just a human invention, and actually what is the most important thing and the most precious currency that I have is awareness, the way what I'm putting effort into, putting attention on. So my question is, Hmm. What is worth my attention? What is worth my perception? And in that sense, in every decision making junction that I have, what should actually be my compass? Is it just like I feel a lot of enjoyment in everything that I do in life? And I just feel like. I'm gradually more and more synced into the synchronization that I feel. Just everything happens right in, this, in, in the right time. And the more and more I go in life, I feel like I, lead, I let my intuition, just my energy, my frequency to lead me on this path. So I would really love to hear what, is, what, is your, what do you think about what is worth our attention? Okay, thank you. It is very important to be very clear as to what you mean when you refer to yourself in the form I. Mm. You know, what, what you were speaking is throughout my life, you know, and my life is, you know, just feel like it's a, a play of synchronicity and, and this and, uh, you know, everything is like a balance of energy and, I'm, you know, it's just really enjoying. And I used to think that time was the most important thing, but actually I'm finding that the more important thing, is uh, the use of my, what did you use the word? Awareness, Your attention. Awareness, awareness, attention, you see. Is there a difference between awareness and yourself when you say, uh, the, the, is my awareness, is awareness something that is possessed by you? Hmm. Uh, I'm just, I have to come this way for a bit and it will become more clear in a second. Because how it feels is that there's a, a fairly firm, strong sense of identity, an identity that is graced in a, a sense of synchronicity. It's moving, it's enjoying its existence and so on. But it, it, it is feeling that it needs uh, something more. And it seems as though you're saying that I really need to be more grounded in something. So could you speak a little bit again for me? Yes. Um, I think I, I, I can understand what you're saying, and I, w I was actually thinking that uh, this would, uh, would be a, um, a proper response, <laughs> because um, the I that is speaking about the awareness, 
Mm. I feel like um, it can be detached from any emotion or, or like any um, sense Are you of speaking necessity. as that or you think speaking about that? As. You're speaking as that, okay. Okay. Um, but there's an awareness that you're speaking as that. I feel like it's from. It's from the? It's from. So awareness itself is speaking? Yes. Okay. Is awareness by itself concerned about synchronicity and time and? Thank you. I feel like the awareness itself has no feeling. It doesn't want anything. But I feel like there's something inside of me that is Mm, there's like the awareness and then there's something, some filter that says like, all right, but now what? Like, where do you want this awareness to be ahead? And I feel like it's, there's a kind of a, thank you for that. There's like kind of a distance between them, the awareness that just enjoying everything, but there's something that wants it to be directed into some point, some, something. Right. So I don't know so how to solve So awareness then becomes a kind of commodity Mm. or a medium. I'm just slowly looking, you know, because I understand how that can be felt like that. But uh, then we are speaking of awareness like as a kind of commodity <laughs> or a medium that uh, needs to be directed somewhere. But can we isolate and say the awareness, uh, is, is it limited in any way at all? I mean, in Not terms of uh, its volume, does it, is, it, is it short in any way? No. Yeah. Because, you see, we can have a concept about awareness. We can have a thought about awareness. So effectively, we turn awareness into a thing that we can go to and look and make use of. But you who are, would be speaking about awareness, are you beyond awareness? Or are you probably an image formed in the awareness, as all images would, would be? Uh, I, feel I think like we need to get somewhere with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I've been waiting for a long time for this. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, I feel like, um, like I said before, I feel like there's the awareness, which is boundless, which is not experiencing fear. Yeah. Is it speaking about itself right now? No. Okay. It's, that's what I wanted to say, that there's the awareness and there's like the... Um, um, some kind of a filter that refers back to the awareness. Okay. It's like, so, like a lawyer that. Yeah, so, so we, can, we can, in a sense, can we say that from the awareness itself that manifests um, as a kind, of, a kind of conscious presence? Hmm? This, uh, I think we can go a little, a little bit like this. From the pure awareness, which is beyond need and, and intention or so on, but it's not dead. Something feels that awareness is dead. It doesn't want anything. It's not passionate. You know, it's a nice place, really. <laughs> you know? But it doesn't have passion. It doesn't have desire. It doesn't want to motivate and move in life. So something does. Something appears like that. And I would say it is this, this, this seed of I amness. The, 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 the sense in which we know that we exist. The feeling of existence in the body. Um, that seems to have a f play of autonomy and that has, the, it has intelligence and the ability to reflect and discern and so on. So it's, it is at the very bridge between the unmanifest pure awareness and the beginning of life and the world and, and the dynamic mm. expression of living and accomplishing and doing and tasting all the diversity from all the seeds of life. So that aspect we know because we are experiencing that now. We come here, I'm in Rishikesh, we're doing this, I'm feeling really good, I like to be by the Ganga, da, 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 da. So all that kind of, all that, that experiencing uh, capacity, the diversity within it, I sometimes, uh, for my own sake, I prefer to call that, that's the experience inside the theatre of consciousness. Sometimes you may call it the God's Leila or something, the play mm. of God, in which we have the sense of individuality. There's myself and others. 
There's some things I don't know and some things I wish to know. And all of this, all of this can come there. But that is not something that the pure awareness of itself needs or wants. Okay? So it feels like we are too aspected. We are aware of this pure awareness field, uh, but we are more attracted, the we now, meaning mm. the, our conscious self in expression as existence, we are at, attracted to the, that feeling of existence and where that existence wants to direct its attention and the desires that has come. So I feel it's quite so a much thing. so. I feel like it's funny. I feel like there's like um, um, if I like to observe the, the two entities, the awareness and the and the lawyer. From where would you be standing to observe both? From an identity, per, from identity. Yes. Just for the it, purpose of yes. Some kind is, of is identity a reliable enough tool to no. gauge the reality of either? <laughs> it's okay. changing all the time. Yes. And its changefulness is observed by what? By the, um, by the awareness, the pure one. Yes, yes. But still, we are still referring to awareness as though it's a segmented somewhere else, and there's mm. my light, there's me, and then there's all of this potential to blossom and, you know. <laughs> you know? No, no, it's, it's fine, because that experience feels authentic for nearly everyone. No? I'm aware that I've got a life and I'm, I'm practicing spirituality, I'm developing a certain intuitiveness or powers, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm making my way to God, you know, not too fast, but you know, just going, and, or whatever it is. I'm enjoying my existence, I'm loving the play of transcendence, it's just wonderful, I love all this spirituality and so on. And then there is behind me, somehow, there's this big awareness, but I know I'm that, but... Um, I'm not ready to just be that. Uh, I have a lot of things to do, people to see, places to go, things to do. You know? So we know this play. And, 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 and it, you know, it's not a trick, you know, it, it, it is that too. But what I would want to say is that none of this is possible without the awareness itself. You cannot have all of that without awareness. You may be unaware of your awareness, but you cannot have, you cannot be nor have any of this without awareness. You see? It's like you can exist without all this mind stuff, but this mind stuff cannot exist without you. Okay? You must judge which is the greater, which is the most stable. So while this virility is inside the consciousness to proliferate, to grow, to capture, to experience, to evolve, and all this dance, then it is not so appealing to be guiding you back to the awareness self, unless all of this play, this excitement, this dance, this, this power of life, which is an expression of life also, that there is within that a little button that I can touch and you realize, but it's true, I'm, I'm really just here. And this dance of manifestation and so on, it's fine, but it's not fine when I, the pure consciousness, I'm experiencing a state of hypnosis where I believe I am mostly this. Mm. You see? But I don't know how we're going to come to that, because often it's when the beings, the manifestation of consciousness, begin to suffer the manifestation in a way. They are struggling that the projections don't work, the things are not working, you know? This is kind of like fertile soil for trans tran tran transitioning into higher states of consciousness, because something wants to just enjoy, it wants to enjoy through the senses, wants to enjoy through the mind, it wants to adventure, it wants to create, it wants to go, until at some point in the manifest realm, it begins to lose its power to mm to proliferate in that way, and it's brought back to its knees, and it begins to look again in a new way. So, I don't want to interfere with that. If someone say, but I'm happy, I don't know, I'm not ready to be in the stillness of consciousness, I'll say, I may say, listen, your take on pure awareness is illusory, mm. because the, the invigorated being is going, no, but the awareness is fantastic, it's absolute, but I'm not ready, because that's just being still. 
But that is not an assessment of awareness. I feel like, mm, yeah, for sure. I, I've been suffering for a long time, and just recently I've, I've been acknowledging that and um, acting upon it, um, traveling the world and quitting the job and all, a lot of the things. But uh, still, I, 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 just yesterday, I just walked back home from Ramjula and I felt really um, like the manifestation is, is not something happy or something exciting. It's just me walking all the way, you know, without a rickshaw, without anything. And I felt like something very pure, just walking, not expecting anything. Just like when I sit in meditation or just um, the sense of waiting, but nothing is expected to be happening. So I'm just like, just like there. That's fine. That's fine. Um, as yet, one has not um, not established in the awareness, you know? Mm. That's not what I'm just saying. You know, that, that, uh, that, uh, that may happen because in that natural state, it's not against activity. Not against activity. It's almost you go back and you're stripped of all your dreams in some way. You've come so pure, pure, you know? And then you go back into the field. Mm. It's very different. Uh, your reference to self as an individual account feels very weak mm. because one is experiencing from a space of totalityness. I don't know, but I cannot convey this with the mind. One does not find fault with the world particularly. It understands that it is the mechanism of uh, consciousness in its dance as karma and uh, the unfolding drama of the universe. Right in the same earth, we are all experiencing it differently, but the one who is awake has brought heaven to earth, in a way, and still is not even attached to that. <laughs> you understand? I am not presenting it, oh, wow, yeah, I want some of that. <laughs> no, I am just saying that gradually uh, something is uh, coming into pure seeing that is not based on the, the experiences of personhood. Everything is being experienced somehow, but nothing sticks. In fact, nothing sticks now. Yesterday, wherever you might have been, you may have met people, you look in their eyes, just like we are looking at each other right now. You may have had a feeling, you may have felt, Wow, man, I am so happy to meet you. But that was yesterday, and today it is not like this. It is a fresh discovering. You can't turn back and pick up something from yesterday and show a sample of it today. Everything is like a cloud passing. Everything is like a cloud passing. Some pass very quickly, some very slowly. But awareness is like the sky, unchanging. Is awareness against clouds? Not at all. Can clouds hide the awareness? From what? From awareness? <laughs> or from some other point? Is it apathic to the clouds? Is it? Apathic to the clouds? Like it doesn't really care about the clouds? Actually, it's a good point. It's not, it doesn't care passionately. It cares in its natural harmony. It's like Babaji once said, if the hand puts food in the mouth, should the mouth say thank you to the hand? <laughs> they are one. They are one. So you come to see when I say life takes care of life, it's not passionately, it's just like this. It cares. And it's not so it's not dry, you know. It is full of completeness in every way. So it's not that it doesn't care. I I I'm happy that you say that because it's a very popular statement to say Arenas doesn't care whether you live or die and so it's not really true. It's not the way. It is. It's not that. It's, it, we are speaking a very different way. Awareness is what we are. Awareness doesn't call itself awareness. The word awareness is a, we use this term from consciousness to speak, like on behalf of the absolute. The absolute is not something like this, but something like this. 
might momentarily appear in the absolute uh, spaciousness, but it cannot be defined by any shape or size or activity. It is our natural state. It's our natural state. But while we have the passion of life, the life force, and the power to imagine and to project, we, the consciousness in our temporary aspect, as personhood, are deeply fascinated by our sense gratification, sense objects, senses, the ability to imagine, to dream, to experience, to interpret, to discern. All these forces are playing, and we are very attracted to the dynamic expression of consciousness. And there is nothing wrong with that, nothing at all. It is consciousness operating, causing this whole system to function like that and everything in its right moment. The place you are speaking from, maybe someone is, would be aspiring to reach to that place. But the one who truly sees is not aspiring for anything. Like the sun is not aspiring for anything, it's not even shining. <laughs> and yet, because it is, all life comes into play. Uh, yourself is like this. But it's very difficult to appreciate this from the place of the under mental understanding. So this is why it is good that we are slowly, slowly deconstructing of our delusion thoughts and coming into like a Polaroid, coming into the clarity of your true self. Maybe we cannot take it full blast all at once, unless those who can take it happen like that. We are gradually reacquiring the taste for what you are you see we're coming a bit out of this this play of diversity orientation nothing is wrong with diversity but when the one who we take ourselves to be is attached to so many things and so on then we are not experiencing the fullness of who we are so it's just like that um, each one at this present stage of looking it's okay up to a point when people come and they say, I am kind of stuck with this and I want to go beyond this, then I may feel that there is a, a richness of conversation that could really empty out into ultimate seeing. And why not? Mm -hmm. Because we take, because of the use of the mind, we take what we think and what we value through the mind as being almost, you know, it's, it's, it's necessary, it's needful. It's so important, it's essential, that when you wake up to the truth of yourself, it, the, the pleasures of the mind is a very small thing, a small thing. Yet it doesn't curse this small pleasure. It puts it there, so I can't <laughs> speak effectively about it. All I can say, if there is within you the urge to discover, grace has put it there, and grace will act through whatever it is to bring you more deeply into the, the core of your own being, consciously. You know? mm. I feel like the sky and the clouds are in harmony, just Naturally, the, the, the clouds are the clouds and and the sky are just in harmony, just naturally flowing. So yes, yeah. It's it's. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yes, the, if the clouds and the sky are one and flowing in a natural harmony, and it is perceived like that, then the the place of perceiving is more pure. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, wow, the time has moved so slowly. <laughs> what time is it? What time is it? How many time is it? Eleven thirty. Eleven forty. Okay, one moment. Okay. Dear Muji, as a mother, your teachings of just let go and 
do not attach yourself to others conflict in my head. Three years ago, I left my partner after years of abuse to me and my child. We now endure abuse by the legal system. Though I find peace by not participating in court, this decision would risk my child's life, forcing her back to the abusive home. What is a mother to do? Is it even possible to find peace and protect my child? Seeking peace and from the United States. It's one letter now. So again, as a mother, you're teaching, just let go and do not attach yourself to others' conflict in my mind. You have put here a text, but, and I may well have said these things, but you have not put the context in which I would have said such a thing. So it would not be fair for me to just pick up on this, because I would not just go to somebody and say, just let go, and don't attach yourself to others. I must be already in a trusted relationship of conversing with you to reach that place, to say that, whereby you are in a good place to hear it in the correct way. You understand? I don't throw giveaway statements to people, because in each one, the words must act to their maximum importance, you see? So it's not a throwaway, I go to people and say, just let go. It, it, it won't stand. But if I'm speaking with you, at a certain point I can say, how about you don't hold on to that for a moment and see what it feels like? And you may say, oh, oh to let go. A lot of fear is coming. And I say, yes, yes, the fear is coming. Uh, you want to stop? You can stop. But I'm with you, you can let go, and I just want you to watch. Then you may say, that was the context in which I said that. But just to say, your teachings of just let go and do not attach yourself to others conflict in my head. Then you leave me having to kind of work out what you, where we're coming from here. Three years ago, you say, I left my partner after years of abuse to me and my child. We now endure, we must imply me and my daughter or child, we now endure abuse by the legal system, whatever that may be. Though I find peace by not, underlined, not, by not participating in court. So, by avoiding going in court, I find there's some peace. If I was going to be pulled into court, already I'm going to be very disturbed. Perhaps you don't want to have this kind of confrontation with your husband in front of the whole world or whatever. So you think, if I can avoid that, I won't. Okay, maybe. This decision would risk my child's life, whatever that may mean. It may mean that if I go to court, my husband or ex-husband would be so angry, he's so uh, revengeful or vengeful, that maybe he will do something bad to us, he's this type of person. I don't know. This letter does not say that. Okay? So, again, I back up a little bit. We now endure abuse by the legal system, though I find peace by not participating in court, this decision would risk my child's life, forcing her back to the abusive home. Muji, what is a mother to do? Is it even possible to find peace and protect my child? Seeking peace. Rather than give you advice as though I'm giving an advice to a person, I prefer not to give advice to a person. I'd want to help you to come to a place more deep inside yourself where my advice will bear really big fruit but I don't trust to speak to a person, to the person mentality, who to say, do this, because you can't. You are in a very weak state of mind at the moment, because very much you are suffering mostly personhood. I don't know if you can see this. It's mostly in a state, what can I do? What can a mother do? I do this, abuse, blah, blah, blah. So you are functioning 
just on the top of your head. You have not uh, somehow been able to go down to here yet. From here, you will find that you are naturally conversant with a much deeper and auspicious life. Here, no, panic, emergency, risk, trouble, fear, desperateness, if we are functioning from the top of our head. So, my advice would be to please go and listen a few times to the invitation. The invitation will just drop the energy slowly from here, bring it down, bring it down, bring it down, into the place where you naturally can be receptive to higher counseling and guidance. If I were to say, well, you know, you know, send him a this thing, send him a no, no, I am not going to do that. I know better than that. I'll say, please listen to the invitation a few times. Okay? Can you trust my advice? Listen, listen, and get back to feeling yourself again. Not your panicked mind, not the mother situation. First, spend a little time, get back into your heart again. When you're in your heart again, you will see that life is not against you. Life is not against you. If you're functioning from your person, you're likely to make wrong choices. You're coming from a fearful place. So, Sally, Anne, rather, you listen to the invitation, let be guided by it to re-experience your true place. When you're in your true place, it might spontaneously come through urges, energetically, or just through a thought, or just by seeming coincidence, you meet someone who can take you to the next high place. Trust it. Trust it. Don't be fighting with, uh, you know, trying to fight, uh, you know, uh, a rhinoceros with your long fingernails. It's not going to work. You simply get back to your strength, your peace, because you say, seeking peace. And then the invitation, if you listen, maybe first time you find your mind is still in some kind of tsunami, there's some kind of turbulence and so on, but keep listening and gradually it will bring you energetically, bring the attention back inside the heart. When you are here, you are restored. You are restored. The more you listen to this, then you are not only restored, you are cured from this hastiness, this out of alignment with your own natural power. And when you are sitting inside the heart of yourself, you find that life comes in and begins to open up possibilities that presently are there, but you may not even see them, because you are in a confused state, frustrated state. You are feeling that, I am not sitting in grace, please help me. So, Muji, what is a mother to do? I am sending you, please listen to the invitation. It's only twenty-five minutes, sit, listen, listen again, listen again. Just keep listening, relax a little bit. Take a little time for yourself. Don't take time for your problems. Take a little time for yourself. Come back again. Naturally, it brings your mind back into alignment with your heart, and things are going to work very differently. All of life work like this. You cannot go at life hammering at life, and it's going to produce good fruit. You must come into life as life itself. You come back into life alive. You come back, and these guidances, being in satsang, because the more you operate from the mind up here, the mind doesn't want to come to satsang. You won't want to come to satsang. You want a quick fix, but it's not a real fix. You are rediscovering yourself in a more auspicious, gentle, potent, powerful way. 
the more you discover yourself as you are, the less you will feel that you need. You come back to your natural grounding and the natural support of everything in the universe, because you are available to yourself again. So, final question, is it even possible to find peace and to protect my child? More than that, yes, you will find peace and contentment, maybe even forgiveness also, and you'll find that your being happy is the greatest security you can give to your child. You being happy, you being at peace with yourself, is more than you can imagine as a gift to your children. They don't need an extra car, they don't need a, a redecorated bedroom, they don't need a, you know, a new iPhone, they don't need that. To see your parent at peace with themselves gives great security to the child's mind. A happy parent is worth much more than all the riches in the world. Muji, I accept you as a true master sent to me by grace. I watch the satsangs, do the online retreats, but since you introduced the invitation, I have struggled with it. I can answer the questions from my heart, but the room of being that I enter is such a bleak and uninviting space. The room of being. The room of being what? The room of being hmm? that I enter is such a bleak and uninviting place. It is like a cheap flat with the previous tenant didn't clean when they moved out. The floorboards are bare and dusty. There is rubbish in the corners. Can this be my emptiness? I love your teachings and have benefited so much from following your pointings. What am I doing wrong? Where is my isness? Moira from Australia. And I have a picture also of Moira. Where is the isness? This is a new one for me. I'm not really. Uh, I'm going to put everything down for a minute for this one. Here, you see? <laughs> Muji, I accept you as a true master sent to me by grace. I watch the satsangs, I do the online retreats, but since you introduced the invitation, I have struggled with it. I never heard that before. Okay. I can, with stars, I can answer the questions from my heart. But the room of being, the room of being that I enter is such a bleak and uninviting place. It is like a cheap flat that the previous tenant didn't clean when they moved out. <laughs> you know this type of place? Okay. The floorboards are bare and dusty. There is rubbish in the corners. Can this be my emptiness? No. It cannot be your emptiness. This is the room of being, not the room of becoming, not my friend's room, not university room, student's room. Okay? In this, something is happening, and she puts in quote also, but the room of being. Why should the room of being be so dirty? 
It must be the room of the mind. How can the room of being? The room of being is empty, beyond even the concept of empty. Nothing there. There are no dirty floorboards there. Pre there were no previous tenants also. <laughs> so Moira, I have to come and check it out with you. What is this? And there's rubbish in the corners. It has no corners. So I don't know. This is a particular kind of mind projection. Why the room of being? I, has anybody got an invitation book? I have to, yes. Can I see it this, uh, quickly? I want to see if I have to rewrite the book or something about that because <laughs> I'm missing something. Thank you. Let's go to the room of being. Find this dirty page. Ah. <laughs> huh? Okay, so um, I'm going to read a little bit, okay? <laughs> he says, Today we are here to discover our true self, our very own being, that which is real and in accordance with the insights and direct experience of all the greatest sages and seers of all time. Through the grace of the invitation, we too will directly experience that the one self alone exists and that we are one with it. If you are longing for self-discovery and the urge to be free is alive and compelling, this invitation is for you. Grace has put this yearning inside your heart and so it is possible to come to this direct recognition without delay. It works, it works, it works. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, and always. Let's begin. Okay? You say, as an example, general example, I want to discover the truth as it really is. Please help me. I want to know and be who or what I truly am not my ego and conditioning. I don't want to waste any more time. I wish to be finished with what is false. My life, lived in the identity of a person, feels very restricted and shallow. It is not really working. I want to know and be in harmony with God, who is truth. I wish to wake up today to the unchanging perfection that you point to and that I witness in you. I want to be in that state permanently. Can you help me? Okay? Now. <laughs> From the room of being, <laughs> I invite you, come in. But before you enter, Please leave your shoes outside, as is customary. We do that here in satsang. Please leave your shoes outside. One more thing. Also leave your mind outside, because it will only get in the way of what you truly wish to find. Then you say, but how to leave my mind outside? That's the big thing. 
Leaving the mind outside simply means leaving all your ideas aside, just for the moment. Leave aside all that you believe you are and all that you think you know about yourself and about life. Just for the moment, leave it. I ask you to do this just for the short duration of this guidance. That's all I'm asking. Leave aside all thoughts about past and any memories which will tie the mind to the past. Can we do it or not? Sorry? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Don't touch any concern about the future, for no one has ever experienced the future that they imagine. Also leave aside any interpretation about this present moment. This is imitation. I can read on or I can back up a little bit to the pages number three. From the room of being, I invite you. It means I am already speaking from the room of being. I invite you, come in. But before you come in, leave your shoes outside, right? Meaning, leave anything that may be like uh, any thought, any judgment, or dirty shoes, leave outside. Okay? One more thing, leave your mind outside. Now, Moira is saying, I can answer the questions from my heart. But the room of being that I enter is such a bleak and uninviting place. So, you are there by yourself or we are sitting in the room of being? Because I didn't have any dirty floorboards and rubbish in the corner of the room of being. Hmm? But the room of being that I enter is such a bleak and uninviting place. It is like a cheap flat that the previous tenant didn't clean when they moved out. Where did that come from? From your mind. Man is saying, what room of being are you going into? It's a dirty, stinking flat. And you think you're going to come out all nice and clean from coming to a dirty place like this? So I wonder how far you went into this invitation if the room of being was already dirty. So the mind was on the attack already. It's pushed quickly, inserted, before you put your foot in. Ugh, my God, the room of being is a dirty place. How can I come out clean? Boom. You finish. It's almost no point to read further because something has registered. If the room of being is dirty, how can I find something clean? So our minds are already sneaky trying to find a place. And this is why I said before leave these things aside. Leaving the mind aside, meaning don't hold on to any thought construct, any kind of belief system, any self. Evaluation. Just leave all of that. Like, just be empty. Just like when you go into deep sleep, there are no thoughts. Can you do that consciously? Yeah, you can. Even if thoughts are buzzing around, don't engage with them. That's it. Suppose we are listening, we go to a, a concert, an orchestra, and a big band, wow, so many different sounds, a magnificent sound. And I said, you know, um, my cousin is playing, the, is playing the, the flute. Can you hear? And you have to single out the flute and listen. Can you do it or not? Of course you can do. Suppose you, you met someone you have not seen since your childhood days at school, and 30 years later you bump into them, they are just about to board a bus, but they got 10 minutes, and you say, can we have a cup of tea together? You go into a cafe, and it's full of people talking. Can you have an intimate conversation or not? Of course you can, because your intention is that I just want to speak with you. I don't want to be listening to other people. I'm speaking with you. You're coming into the room of being for what business? To be inside your heart. Where is dirty room? Suppose the room was dirty, it doesn't matter. Even if it was dirty, they call it rubbish in the corner. I didn't ask you to come clean up a room. I said, come inside the room of being. 
And something comes and creates this thought. And something stopped and says, no, trouble from the very beginning. I'm on to page three. <laughs> so go back again, Mora, and listen this time. Watch the mind trying to do that. This is not a room with walls and window and carpet and pictures on the wall. This room is a formless room. It's a room of presence. And listen again, you see? So what I mean is that we don't need to refer to any of these things now. They are not important for finding freedom and mostly they just get in the way, all the things you usually have. For now, just leave all these things aside. Be entirely empty and free. Simple thing. And I ask you, can you accept this to this point? I really recommend that we listen to the invitation because it did not come from the mind. It came from grace. It came for you as a friend. Listen, follow. It's just revealing. It's like looking in a mirror and finding a perfect reflection of your face. The mirror is not giving you opinions. It's not saying, you look great today. It's never too busy. It never tells you, listen, I'm a bit busy reflecting some insects at the moment. Can you come back in 15 minutes? No. It's fresh every time. Your being is like that. Okay. I have a space for one more letter or one more person. What I should have? Letters come from a person too, you know? There's someone here, someone is here. Is you? Okay, come and see you then. Hi, Muji. Um, for me, is uh, very clear the the first bird that you say, and uh, also the the second bird. But um, in this day, I'm trying to to catch also the third bird that you speak about. I didn't speak about any third bird. Okay. So. Just to refresh for those who may mm, be hearing for the first time, I gave an example a few days ago. It may have been from the first week. And I will just, it's short enough, so I'll just put you back in the picture. I said that there's a, there's a if you imagine, a, a, there's, a, there's a picture now. Here, there's a tree by the edge of the ocean, uh, or a forest. And on a branch sits a bird that is uh, building a nest and uh, babies and getting food and so on. So this bird represents our life in the world, you know, our culture of, you know, having a life, making a family, you know, having a job, you know, doing the best you can to create or fulfill our, our image of what we think is a successful life, what you have. That's the first bird. I feel that most people can relate to this image that we are in our life, you're studying, you're at college, you're just getting married, whatever it is, you're in the life flow. Then I point to another bird who is sitting on a branch just above that first bird. I say, I just call it second bird, you know. This bird is sitting, it looks identical in form to the first bird, but this bird is not building anything, it has no nest, it's not doing anything, it just sits 
and it quietly looks as though it's observing the first bird but also it is panoramic in its seeing it's aware of the wind and the sky or the trees, birds passing, everything it just quietly looks this bird it relates to an ability within the first bird actually but an ability within ourself to just observe but without getting involved to observe with detachment can we relate to these two images for a minute? no? so you say that I am aware of the first bird what it represents having a life, going to university, studying, whatever, having a first job your first partner, relationship, maybe family, traveling, life you say, I can relate to the second bird which is the place within myself where I am quietly observing I am quietly just observing but this place of quietly observing is not projecting anything like I want to do this in the future and so on it is just quietly looking can you relate to this place within yourself? I go if you want I need to have some check-in from you or like this you can relate to the first bird situation the second bird which is that place within ourselves where we have learned to just observe and you see that in observing from the place of observing it is quite a quiet place it is not busy it is not planning future it just is and it is simply observe no? I ask you if you can be relating to this you say yes I can see this then he say but I am having trouble at the third bird I said meaning what? is there not a place where even the one who is observing first bird life situation that the observer of this is this one also observable? this was my question is it also observable? and he invented a third bird I didn't use third bird but I'm only asking is this also observable? by saying this I'm really pushing the boat out and I'm pushing the button here because most people are living life at first bird position you understand? we are just engaged with how we can make ends meet and pay the bills and can we have a holiday this year and blah 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 second bird position is often what we say we are deepening in our awareness in life we are becoming more wise we are becoming more quiet learning to observe life than to just merely just be in the reflex the actions, reactions and interactions are also observed and in that place where they are observed with detachment there is a sense of peace and expansiveness we don't get excited too easily about things we have noticed that things come and go and that we don't have to panic and try to interfere with the unfolding play of life so much and the more we observe with this detachment we are coming to see that wait a minute life is not opposed to life it kind of takes care of life if I didn't observe I might find that I'm interfering with things prematurely I'm moving in haste and to that extent I'm not able to perceive life as being peaceful and taking care of life so from the first bird position if I stay only there it can feel like I have reasons to be afraid because life is very unpredictable and things go wrong and life is always at the verge of becoming chaotic and I must control and but the second bird being recognized that pos position we see that no 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 slow down not so fast just look the first bird mind is going to I don't have time to sit around looking I got things to do places to go people to meet second bird it just quietly notices even that and feels a level of contentment and peace first bird is very much in the mode of personhood second bird is functioning from the place of presence you understand this thing? 
from the place of conscious presence, it is not perceiving itself so much in the drama and karma of life. It is more a quiet observer, looking. Okay? Is the life of the second bird credible? You understand? Is the life of the second bird, is it of any real value? Does anybody want to know this place? Is it, can, be, can it be seen as really now my life is much better? Or is it that the second bird position, the first bird parents or friends start to say, you become so lazy. Look at you. Get a life. <laughs> and the second bird goes, oh my God. You know, must... Does it happen like that? It could. Maybe the second bird finds itself in panic, back in first bird position, and not liking it, and then uh, in second bird position. Okay? <laughs> and now, this second bird position, we say, is a little bit like the movement from person to presence. I put it that the state of presence is a much more calm, much wider life, much more space for openness, for compassion, for understanding, perhaps even more love is flowing there. Okay? And largely, most spiritual disciplines and practice is to try and transition from first bird person into second bird presence states. Then I say, keep staying with this, because there for a while they may seem like an oscillation from presence to person. Presence to person. Then gradually something stabilizes more in presence. Okay? Now you're saying, but, and I'm also saying, I was saying, can the second bird position, which is already good, peaceful, intuitive, hmm? calm, happy, can this second bird position? be also observed from a deeper place. How many yeses I can have? Yes. Yes. That's pretty good. So, from, so then, uh, what is it like at this other place, this deeper place? I'm not going to call it the third bird, but if you want to call it third bird, third, third bird, okay? We're out of the bird thing now. So, something is here whereby the functioning of life, the dance of the manifest life, no? and the one who is perceiving it calmly and enjoyably, that also is seen. In the place where the second bird and the first bird are both seen, in this place, what is happening there? Is that a credible place? Has anybody, does anybody know this place? Or is it that we know this place, plus within our own being, the first bird and the second bird is still very active, and this third bird or no bird position is not stable yet? So we can look like that, and it is a an helpful example and metaphor, no? Of how to locate your true position. So now you say, carry on from there. Yeah, you, because it's not clear for me the perceiving uh, the perceiver. Like, uh... Yes. One thing that happens is sometimes with the mind, because we speak of first bird and then second bird, if it was finished there, probably you'd do really well. But the mind heard there's a third bird. And it wants to be champion. I want to go, third bird. But it is not yet mature enough to be in third bird position. Okay? So then you start to think, I'm having trouble with you know, this third bird position. I said, Who told you about third bird? You are second bird or what? Have you, have you stabilized in that place where you are able to perceive the life moving even as it moves in this body? Actions, reactions, interactions are happening, but there's a stability here in the seeing. Have we come to that place? 
and be careful that the mind doesn't go, yeah, but there's another place and it's better than this place. Let's go there. And find that it's still your mind struggling to say, I'm having trouble with this thing about the perceiver and the perceiving. I'm not in a hurry to push people over the edge. Only when you're ready, according to your capacity. The one who has moved from identification with the activities of life that rarely has any time for self-reflection, that there's too many, you know, time is money. I can't spend time, you know, you eat your lunch standing up and all this type of stuff because, you know, in that life, which is experienced for a while, you're going to burn out somehow. When you burn out, maybe you might come to second bird position. Burnt bird, I don't know, but you look there <laughs> and you can say, wow, you know, it was good that I burn out because at least I'm able now to observe that and I don't have any attraction to go back into that noise. So, something has crossed over from a life of chaos into a life of peace. You are aware that you're not just your busy ego mind running about looking for more, 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 but in this quiet place of observing, you are aware that you're here and your life feels much, much more rich, content, fulfilled, spacious, happy. And we can be in this state for a very long time. You may even come to a state we call Satchidananda, which means that you are aware that you naturally are existing and you are not existing only from your birthday, maybe. Not necessary. Satchid means that you are conscious. This power to observe is an expression of consciousness. I'm not actually doing anything, but observing of things are happening rather than the doing, doing, doing mode, quietly just observing. That's the chid, satchid. When we are aware of our existence and that we are conscious of our existence, then ananda, meaning the joy of existence or the bliss of being, is also present. This satchidananda quality, you may say, is the nature of the self. But why did I mention about beyond this one also? Are we fit? I say, but even the second bird, and I would prefer that we at least have conquered second bird position, meaning that we are stable, we understand that something, that even that beautiful place of being, which you still have eye consciousness, I like this, yes, I prefer to be like this, I, me, and you know, I hope one day to go beyond this thing, where that voice is still alive and active in us, that there is a space beyond this in which even this beautiful state of presence is itself observed as a functioning. Then you say, I am having trouble there, but I am not insisting that you go there. Maybe we're not ready. Or maybe something is feeling, yes, you know, is, is something has sufficiently stabilized in the place of conscious presence. It feels like it's my natural uh, state. But there is now, curiously, something is, is keep showing that that itself is also observable. But from the place where that is also observed, something feels not stable here enough. Then I say, but the sense of not being stable is also observed or not. And they say, oh yeah, that is observable also. What is observing? Can that which is observing all these things, can that itself be observed? Whoa, big trouble. Can that ability to observe the gross and the subtle forms of manifestation, that which is observing all things, can that itself be observed? Meaning, if it can be observed, it becomes a thing observed. If it becomes a thing observed, the one who observes it must be subtler than it. D does this imply an unending suc succession? of observers, or does it lead to a very stable seeing 
whereby they are not unending reflections of observers, then you must apply this. But don't try and jump over a second bird position to try and get to third bird or no bird position. It is a natural thing. If you are authentic in your seeing, you will be stabilizing, enjoying also the sense of detachment, feeling the relief, the unburdening of the first bird posture, now enjoying a sense of spaciousness, intuitively feeling, feeling in correspondence energetically and harmoniously with the universal consciousness. You feel very happy, you naturally feel grateful to existence and so on. Stabilize in this. But if something is itching to say, but even saying stabilizing in this, meaning that that is, it must be itself fluctuating, what would observe this? Then I say, you better go home and sit, zip yourself inside your sleeping bag and marinate into this seeing, without producing pictures about what you're seeing. Try and see if that place of perfect seeing, which is not an itemized seeing, it's not an involved seeing, with, there is no story in him, but it is impossible to refute its existence, because all other existences seem temporary, illusory, transitory, when seen from this place. And who is seeing? Is there eyes in this place seeing anything at all? So as you begin to ponder and to reflect, something is being washed out of your functioning system, and one finds oneself as oneself truly is. Thereafter, you may bring any problem from any segment of time and put it in front of this, and it will not exist. That is your sadhana. If you are drawn to that, and it's not just a mental attraction, because you want to, you want to be the one who get it, because there are many pitfalls on the way, you know. I watched one program one time, it was called uh, the, the Apprentice, the English program. And a lot of people, uh, there was one business entrepreneur, he's called Mr. Alan Sugar. But he's not too sweet, but he's a very, very powerful guy, beautiful, I enjoy to watch him. And he gets a number of people who apply to say they want to be professionals and he's top professional, and he's going to choose the people and make a group of people to then see how they behave with his exercises, and then out of all these people, he will keep uh, firing some, firing some, until he less just maybe with one or two. And then from these two, he's going to choose one person. When he chooses one person, he says, you will be my apprentice. Thank you, all the rest of you, bye-bye, try next time. And he's chosen his apprentice. And one girl came and she won. She won it. And then he says, okay, okay, it's time to start on this date. And she wrote and she says, sorry, sorry, I won't take the job. He says, what do you mean? She said, I was just obsessed with winning. That was my attraction. I wanted to win. I wanted to be a winner. I didn't want the job. I don't want to be no apprentice. I just want to beat people. <laughs> I'm using this example because sometimes in us, we are wanting things for the wrong reason. You want, even one man came to satsang here, he said, I have been a yogi. I have been always the best. Whatever I do, I'm always the best. I am always the best. And so I've been top of my yogic um, discipline. Now I've discovered you. I want to be the best empty person. <laughs> I want to be more empty than everybody. 
I want to be the best nobody. I like him actually because there are other people feel like that, but they won't say. But he somehow say. So if you are wishing to discover the truth, because you want to be first to do it, and we cannot be so clear, because as long as there's ego in us, you cannot rely upon your own judgment. We cannot. You may think you are so sincere. But in that final turning of the lock to open, something will be avoiding. And at least it will be worth to see that. So if you can come to the position whereby you are observing, and you see, whoa, it's not a weekend exercise. Some people are yearning. It is their, their ambition. It is their aspiration to come to a place where they can observe to the extent where life is not a trouble for them. They begin to enjoy the life and themselves as life. They see this. At the point where you can begin to observe that even this one itself is also phenomenal or a function of consciousness, then you are in the position of the unborn, the uncreated. The imperishable, the timeless one. You will not be disturbed by fear or desire. So if you feel you're having when I'm having trouble with this, then I said, Okay, yes, yes, yes. There are some challenges on the way. Challenges are good because it forces you to, uh, or compels you, to really apply your powers of discernment even more. The inquiring power, the inquiring spirit, is also helping to neutralize negative tendencies, vasanic energies, to bring them into peaceful functioning, so that you are the only one left. But you are beyond every category. Is that winning? Is not a competition. Discovering yourself is not a competition. Because if it's a competition, the ego will survive, isn't it? To take the trophy. So it cannot be won by the ego. There was a story that there was one man from a village, a town, and he was voted as the most humble person. <laughs> he, is the most, he is the most humble person. So they gave him a big medallion. Uh -huh. But two weeks later, they took it back from him because they saw him wearing the medallion with open shirt in a disco. <laughs> they said, no, 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 we made a mistake. He is not the most humble person. It was appearing he was the most humble person. But actually, it's full of pride and arrogance. Are we sure? Sometimes people say, you know, I'm not arrogant. Actually, we all possess some arrogance. Thank you. I think you've got the point, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for today, everyone. Please reflect a little bit on what we have shared today and, uh, and how that relates within your own self, just to keep looking. And somehow the power within you, the, the, the divine intelligence within you, will begin to scan, to search you out, to find the seeds of identity, whereby we are still living in a state of division. Don't be ashamed of this. You are not to be proud of it also, and just be grateful that at least you are experiencing the opportunities to look and to see from the truest place within yourself. As you are doing that, you don't have to try and make life better. The life begins to just shine, radiate with a new life that comes from discovering your true position. So, thank you.
Thank you. Those coming, somebody coming today? I want to say something because I notice that sometimes when I leave the, the hall and I'm um, going out, there are many people who leave the hall early to go to the, be in the queue outside. And many of these people, they're asking blessing, blessing, blessing and this type of thing. The greatest blessing is to understand what I'm pointing to because it will transform your life. Sometimes people want blessing, and they get addicted to blessing and you don't grow. And then something from my own being feels like it's been uh, sucked out but it's not being put to good use. So the best blessing is to really stay here, really make use of the time. You should not really be leaving this room before me, actually. But I'm not a strict person about this way. I was just saying that take every drop people rushing out, if you have to go to the toilet, it's fine. But if you're rushing out to stand in the queue just so that I can bless Mala and all this kind of stuff, I would prefer that you stay here, receive the real blessing, which is to understand what is being pointed to, win your freedom. That would be the highest blessing. Ah, thank you. So, Guruji, this is a prayer, a uh -huh. musical prayer inspired by one of the beautiful prayers from Mala of God. And um, it's so alive inside. And it is, um, O oh Lord, this is your dream, so do what you will, hide me inside you, and forget what you have done. Thank you.
Thank you.